afternoon and welcome back to the Inspiration Stage here at the National Cycling Show. Have you all had a good day so far? Yeah. <laughs> it's great to see so many people here lining up for the Athens. It's fantastic and, and this is the thing, we don't really need this introduction because that is why you've all flocked into the stage. Anna, how's your day been? You've been on the other stage talking all about skills. That's it, yeah, we've got the Cycling 101 stand here at the National Cycling Show, so that's all been about tips and tricks and advice, hacks, everything to make your cycling life easier. Um, it's been wonderful, actually. We've been talking about anything from towpaths, gravel biking, how to index your gears, all, all of you school stuff. All yeah, you over it's here. not the most exciting index in your gears, but it is oh, come on. so, so important. And uh, on that less exciting note, should we get our guests up here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let me say, we, have, we barely need an introduction. They've got uh, eight downhill world titles, 49 World Cups between them. Admittedly, Rachel's played a dominant role in those numbers. Sorry. <laughs> um, they've got their own bike park and they've launched a bike brand under their own family name because it is pretty much a brand in itself. Please put your hands together for Rachel, Dan and G. Hello, hello, welcome. It was brilliant to see you all. And it is fantastic, isn't it, to be at an event in real life and not, I mean, Zoom's been great and all. <laughs> but it's so nice it. to have some human contact. Have you been around the show having a look so far or have you just arrived? No, I've been here the entire time. Uh, Dan and Rach literally arrived about half an hour ago. But I've been here the whole time, so yeah. Met lots of people, everyone's been over to the bike stand, having a look at the bikes and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been exciting so far. It must be nice to like have fans be able to come and meet you in real life again, to actually come and get those selfies with you and talk about what's going on. Yeah, and especially with us having you know quite a new bike company and getting to show people the bike and people are sitting on them, and, you know, kids have had a little ride around and you know you don't get that online on social media. You know, you only get that face to face, and it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you don't even get clean bikes at the W Bike Park, because ours are always <laughs> filthy. It's nice to see them really clean here. Is, is, is the mic on? Hello. One, two, one, two. Um, how often do you get to do stuff as a trio these days? Uh, actually, quite a lot, yeah. If we can get Rach out of the house. She's, uh, apparently you've just had a baby, four weeks. Yeah, don't get me on that topic yet. I'll save it for a little yeah. bit later. I mean, we talk about cycling and stuff, and then I would just like to ask if I'm ever going to sleep again, ever. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to kick off by talking a little bit about your journey on YouTube and social media and how you did originally put yourselves out there as siblings, because when we've talked to a lot of the guys who've been on the demo track over the last couple of days, they were talking a lot about how you've got to see it as a huge part of your job now to be present online, to keep pushing the boundaries and to, to just put yourself out there. Do you feel how much of an impact you three had on that movement? Well, I think when we were, you know, making those those early steps into the riding and, you know, that whole kind of start of our career, it obviously wasn't as, as prevalent as it is now, um, but it was just starting to be a thing and it wasn't something we felt like we had to do, more that we wanted to do and, and were kind of intrigued by it. And, you know, even now, it is a big part of what we do, but there isn't, you know, I don't feel a pressure to do it. I, you know, our sponsors are, are pretty relaxed and it's more us wanting to show what we do. It's more us, you know, if we come up with an idea for a project, you know, whether it's it, it, like a, a big filming project, like one of the ridge lines, or just, you know, messing around in the bike park with, with these guys. It's, it's more just us wanting to show people what we're doing. And, you know, if, you, if you're doing something and you think it's quite cool, then of course you want to share it. And of course you want to show everyone, you know, what daft idea you've come up with. And that's such a big part of it, isn't it? Being authentic and not feeling like you have to make the content, but just enjoying it. Yeah, I think it's been pretty interesting watching Rach. Have Dan a hates social media, so it's like... <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It is hard, but you do feel... A, I feel a pressure, and I think you feel it as well. Like, yeah. to, to do... to put stuff out there that's, 
you know, want to see and it's kind of sometimes a bit complicated what you know, what do people want what are you interested in it's yeah and it's amazing seeing Hard you to... as a mum like you know it's that what you see in real life for you is actually what's happening you know and uh, compared to what you know I'm probably putting up get up early take a shot and do your go back to bed <laughs> you, you never go back to bed <laughs> Oh, well, I was looking around at the audience just now. We do have like, quite a lot of younger people in the audience, and some of them look like possibly they weren't even born when you guys were starting out in your careers, which is terrifying, isn't it? Um, and I think maybe for many people it's just like you, you've been there at the top and that was it from day one, but how did you actually get started in mountain biking and make it into career for yourselves? Well, it was Dan that got us into the, the mountain biking, and. You know, he was always the one that was mad about bikes. He was the one that came up with the idea of, you know, going to race BMX and then making that switch over to race mountain bikes. Your phone is ringing. He, he made you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm on a stage. Quick phone call. Classic Rach. Um, uh, yeah, he did make me. Ray, uh, Dan was literally persuaded us into it, and then, you know, before we knew it, he was sending us down the hills. And, you know, it was it was something we just did because Dan was doing. We just followed him in. And, you know, I, I remember wanting G to ride the bike so badly because I was always riding and I loved it. And I, I was at a friend's house and he had a bike for sale for ten pounds. And I called G, and he was like, "No, I'm not interested." So I, I bought it for him and literally forced him to ride it. So all of my injuries, I blame on Athena, <laughs> yeah, which are many. Yeah, but before that, you. Were road uh, roll skates. Yeah, but it's interesting because someone asked earlier over at our stand, like, how do you get into it? And going back to the social media thing, you know, when Dan and G, well, when we all started, like, Dan started riding, but why? Like, you found magazines and stuff, BMX and magazines, and that gives you inspiration, but the internet now, like, social media, you know, on the one hand, it's, you kind of talk negatively about it, but on the other hand, it's, social media is amazing for inspiring people, and, you can reach across the whole world and see people like yourself all around the globe doing it and that's that's a real positive from social media like, like inspiring people and having people to you know measure yourself against or you know yeah give you inspiration rather than just in your own little bubble as a kid that and i think now it's, it's there's such a difference in how accessible the sport is you know there's so many bike parks popping up you know there's so many places you can just turn up and ride on the weekend and it's pretty cool to see how much the sport's grown just you know just in the time we've been doing it you know it's, it's a very different beast to, to what it used to be and suddenly so many more people seem attracted to it so many more people are coming into it and you know kids that are doing it are younger and younger and you know there's kids over on the stand that are five six seven years old and, you know, they're asking when they can come to the bike park or, you know, so good. how they can learn to jump or do coaching days. And it's so cool to see. So I'm aware we've only got half an hour today and there's so much to chat about, so I'm going to just leap straight into this. Career highlights since you were forced into the sport. <laughs> Career highlights. Tricky, I'd say, you know, winning world championship, of course, winning world champs on, on the same day as Rach was, you know, massive one for me. Um, you know, a couple of good results at Red Bull Rampage. Again, you know, mind blowing to be at that event and, and be in so much fear for the two weeks of there, building a line and then to suddenly manage to survive it, do well, be on the podium, you know, those, uh, events like that really stick with you and, and stick in your mind. And I think, Rachel, sometimes it's not even the accolades we see from the outside is the biggest. You might have a memory or a, a standout goosebump moment that's just, oh, for whatever reason, so special. So many, and like G talking about Rampage, I, I remember watching them at Rampage. Dan couldn't physically fit any more body armor on his body. <laughs> he was trying to strap it all on, he had so much on. And then G goes, dislocates his shoulder, and he's halfway down the mountain. And I was absolutely hammered drunk. And I was like, oh my God, I've got a rescue G. And we were like trying to get to him to fit his shoulder back in. Or like world champs when G and I won, Dan broke his collarbone that morning. We were like, oh, we're gonna go and rescue him. We did the fastest run down the hill to try and get to Afi with a broken collarbone halfway down the track. And it's probably like the fastest we've ever ridden. We're like, don't worry, we're coming to rescue you. 
the little things like that, as well as you know, like obviously the, the race wins and the yeah. success, but funny things like that that stick in your mind. Kind the of highlights of seeing your brothers <laughs> crumpled on the floor. Oh, yeah, okay. no, not, the, not the injury bits. <laughs> not the multiple, multiple victories. <laughs> and by the way, Rachel did manage to get my shoulder back in while she was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Got it covered. Uh, do you think that probably helps though? She uses a bit of a sign, let's just go for it. Because I was perfectly sober. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not so enjoyable for you. Um, and, and I was going to say, are you all very well versed at putting each other's bones back in place now? I believe it's, it's no problem. I'll handle that. What about the time you were testing the hardline jump that you built? And we were at World Champs and we got a phone call the evening for the race. Dad's hurt, hurt himself with dislocated his shoulder, and our mates were there with him. They were like, how do we put the shoulder back in? Yeah, it turns out it wasn't out. It was just oh, oh. It broken off the whole. You know, across, right across my shoulder there, the whole socket and everything had broken Gapping off. And everything. And yanking on it, trying to. and I were like, just pull it hard, hard, and they, they were like, it's passing out, oh. we were like, just pull it. We could hear these guys on the phone trying to pop his shoulder back in, pulling and heaving on it. screaming. Whilst his entire shoulder blade was. There's like shattered. two guys holding me this way, and two guys, <laughs> two guys pulling on it that way, and I was literally passing out. It wasn't. The range was on the phone. Just pull it a bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, self so <laughs> that is it. We don't have to do that advice anymore. <laughs> do not call Rachel. <laughs> and um, on the flip side of that, some, some better memories. We turned this around. <laughs> yeah, I think a highlight for me, of course, is um, in Andorra when we were riding to Comensal and all three of us won World Cup. And, uh, you know, the pressure, it kind of, I, I won on the first day in Four Cross. And then Rach won the next morning, and the pressure was slowly growing for G in the afternoon. He didn't have much choice. Yeah, that was wild. Yeah, didn't want to let the side down. <laughs> and the 2022 season is looking very different for all of you than, than the routine, the run of the mill that's kind of been for years and years. So where are you all at at the moment? Where, uh, yeah. Couldn't be a worse season, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think we've done one event between us. We actually We're thinking about it. We haven't done any races, have you? No, I've been in the hospital. Yeah, for a year. Yeah, for a year. Yeah. No, but um, yeah, the, the race season, obviously Atherton race team is still at the World Cups and it's still, you know, there's, there's guys still there charging hard. We had um, a podium last weekend with uh, Andreas Cole on one of the bikes, which was sick. Um, yeah, first elite men's podium for the bikes, that was sick. But yeah, for, for us three, I'm kind of just starting to have my eye on, on a date when I can get back to some racing this season and you know Rach is dabbling with the idea you know dipping her foot in every now and then she did practice at Fort William which was pretty cool well done. so she's tempted practice this year she's race. tempted every race that comes around she's umming and ahhing about it yeah but G's totally underestimating and underestimating his injury like he had his femur pinned amongst everything else and then they had to redo it at Christmas time so he's like yeah I'm fine I'm fine he's actually a warrior, so it's pretty impressive that he's even back on the bike. You're a legend. <laughs> but yeah, yeah so, to... I mean, for some of the audience that aren't well versed in the details, G had a horrendous crash uh, several months ago. Um, Rachel, the reason that you're off the bike is for kind of much happier news. Yeah, I had a baby. <laughs> She's 10 months, yeah, 10 and a half months, so it's a bit stressed I'm trying to get her to sleep right now, but it didn't work, so. Oh no, if you could pay me, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, we'll just keep our voices yeah. very soothing. Yeah. Um, my partner's got my one month old in the green room, so I'm sure he'll oh take another. But like, time. And then like, I see, when I come to events and see people with kids, I'm like, yo, respect. <laughs> like, it's so gnarly if they're playing. Oh, I don't know what. Massive And gee, I was on being nine when to come today. I was like, I can't, it's too far, like the drive. My anxiety is massive at the moment. You know, you can, you can train and travel around the world like racing, and I thought that was stressful and hard work, but it's totally different now. Like having to get, you know, pack with food, make sure they eat the right time, sleep, and then it's just. And she was like, "Just come, don't be like, just chill out." I was like, "Chill out." It's just. There's your baby. It's such a different. Um, it's such a different ball game having having kids and trying to sort of focus on your own career if you even can you know, it's, it's such a crazy mix so yeah it's massive and taking a, a while to figure out but it's amazing having kids and you don't want to rush it do you, you don't want to rush back to work or rush back to whatever because they're only going to be little ones i'm only having one 
<laughs> did you have an idea of how you were going to feel after giving birth? Like, did you think, right, I'm going to have a timeline in my head that I'll ride or I'll race again? Or did you know that you would just roll with however challenging yeah, it might be? Yeah, I think it's be? just you know, how you feel, really. You know, you didn't, I didn't want to put any pressure on myself to return you know, by a certain date. Sponsors are asking, people are asking, and it's impossible to know how you're going to feel. And, you feel way worse than you imagine. So, and, and at the same time, I don't want to rush it. You know, I want to. It's my choice to have a baby, and I want to be there and enjoy it. Not. Well, I've been racing for nearly 20 years, and it's it's a privilege really to be able to make that decision, not to rush back to work. And and that's kind of yeah. I feel really lucky to to be able to still do you know some aspects of my job and and be at home with her as much as I can. And, so hard though when you when you had a baby at the top of your sport. You yeah, know, she literally went from winning World Cups to having a baby and she's still riding unbelievably. She's so fast, you know. When we, when we ride with her, she, she is a World Cup pace. So that, that like, torn mentality to race or to stay at home is always so hard, isn't it? Yeah, and the riding, I probably ride more now than when I was racing, you know, riding every weekend at the bike park since she's been born, really. Yeah. Like, for me, that's kind of, my time to chill out and, and feel like a kind of not that you don't feel like yourself when you've had a baby but feel like you know yourself and, and it, I'm lucky to have my mum on hand so when me and my partner get to ride at the weekends and, and I feel fast but riding a bike fast is almost the easy bit you know you can ride fast if you're comfortable confident but being strong physically takes a lot of training a lot of gym time a lot of work and, and that's the bit that I, I'm struggling to, to do because I'd rather have a nap than go to the gym, <laughs> you know, run to sleep or... Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> so I that's like a real hard balance to find, like, I can't really find the motivation to train as hard as you need to to race World Cups. For me, it's been fascinating. It's like an insight into how important that mental side is to, to, to sport and, you know, in cycling. Like, it's, it's incredible to see Rach where, you know, she's riding her bike and physically She's just as fast, you know, she's riding just as, as, as quick and aggressive as ever she is. But the mental side is, you know, in elite sport, it's so important. And it's only the slightest shift in, in your mentality or, or your view, you know, the, the mental side only has to be adjusted fractionally. And it, it does change who you are and, and changes your outlook. And, you know, uh, even though Rach has is, is had that slight mentality shift because it's a baby, you know, after an injury, you see it in a lot of people, it, you know, the mental side is so important to be able to get on top of and, and be, be in control of it, if you like. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think also um, something that you posted about is obviously the physical challenge. And I think that helps so many people for someone at your level to say, this is what my body has been through. I can't rush, I don't want to rush back. And actually, I think it takes the pressure off everyone looking to you to say, actually, I'm not ready to do whatever it might be I want to get back to. Yeah, like, like you said, whether that's, you know, you're coming back from an injury or something else, you know, life changing or having a baby or whatever it is, you've got to respect, you, you know, you've got to respect that, that your body and, and give it time. And as athletes, you know, G's a case in point. You're just always rushing to come back. You're like, oh, yeah, I can walk like that. I'll do. I can get back on the bike. You know, you're just always pushing your body. You never give it enough time. And I think it's after having a baby, it's it's such a massive shift that you you can't really rush it because you will end up with another injury. And I snapped my Achilles tendon just before I got pregnant. So it's it's felt like everything's all happened at once. And I I want to. I feel like pressure to. For, for the women out there to come back to racing to, to show that you could or you know that having a baby doesn't have to be the end of your career or whatever but it, that in itself is, is a big task so yeah I'm not sure what will happen. <laughs> well the impact you're having is massive. <laughs> Thank you. And talking about the other baby in the room, your brand, um, you've been nurturing that from day one before it's even a twinkle in your mind's eye. Um, how, how did that all come about? Because it's been a slow process. You haven't just jumped into it both feet first really quickly. Nice segue, Anna. <laughs> yeah, I think... I, I guess the difference between what we did and how we structured the team was that from a very early age, we kind of invested back into the team and we got our own 
team manager, our own chefs, our own mechanics, and so that structure always stayed the same, you know. And and then sponsors would just sponsor our team, which was Atherton Racing, and so we kind of got used to building a brand, even though we weren't really sure what we were building. The structure was still there, and now we've kind of followed that through, and it's slowly grown to the point where it's become a bike company and you know we knew that we put in so much work over the years we knew we wanted to do something big and something kind of bold and it was it was a, a funny way around that it happened as in we knew we wanted to do you know this kind of thing and we talked about a bike company in the past but we had no idea how you know we couldn't see a, a way to do it because you know it's it's an enormous thing to take on and you know, we, we knew that. We knew that it wasn't something we could just do alone. And, and, you know, you don't get up one day and just start a bike company. So, you know, it was something we had to build over a bit of time and, and gradually we would meet the right people. And, you know, whether it's meeting certain engineers or, or, or other guys that would work out. And we gradually kind of started to put a small team together around us. And then it got to the point where we thought, right, you know, th there is a possibility that this could happen now. And we had to make that decision. Do we carry on you know, with sponsors, doing the race team as we have been in the past, or do we make that leap of faith, you know, throw ourselves into this 100%, try and get a bike ready, and turn up the next race season with our own bike? And you know, that off season is only a few months long, so there was a, a very small window where we had to make the decision, figure out how it could work, and then make it happen. So, you know, it was terrifying at the time, and it still is, you know, but I think we all knew once we could see how it could happen, we had to go for it, you know, we, we had to at least try and, and make it happen. And, you know, if it, if it had been something that, that had been within our reach and then we, we kind of let it slip, I don't think we, you know, we would have regretted that for a long time. So, you know, we, we made the jump, we kind of committed ourselves to it, and yeah, it's so far it's, it's working. And you, you went out to Taiwan a, a couple of years before, and, you know, we had that idea to do it, but how would you do it? And Dan went out there and was like, Ooh. Yeah, it was, I mean, we were obviously thinking about it at the time we rode for Trek, and, you know, G and Rach were kind of at the peak of their careers, so the money was good, and it's so hard to step away from that. But we started to think about it, yeah, I went out to Taiwan and kind of looked at what was going on, and what, how they were building the bikes out there, and it didn't really like mesh with how we were pushing the sport you know with events like red bull hardline and we were just starting the bike park and everything that we were doing was pushing the sport and pushing the boundaries and and then you went out to taiwan and the bikes were being built by you know people who never seen these events they were on a production line laying out carbon and you know they, they didn't know if that bike was going to joe blogs or to Hardline or to World Cup, and so there was, you know, there was the kind of the amount of love and attention that was going into the into the bikes that we were riding was pretty pretty far off the mark in in my eyes, you know. So I thought, you know, if we're going to do it, we need to we need to do it well, and we need to really get that attention to detail finely tuned, and that's where that additive manufacturing comes in, you know. It's amazing. It is amazing that the technology that we use for the bikes is basically 3D printing, which I didn't know you could do with, you know, proper metal. I thought it was like plastic glasses and stuff. Um, and it, it's so cool seeing that, you know, we have now our headquarters are in Machantlith where we live in, in Mid Wales and we just started manufacturing everything there. So the bikes are literally, you know, born and bred in the UK, in, in Wales there and, and made. And, on Fridays, we have an open house at the HQ, so you can come and look around, and a couple of the engineers will show you around the machine, and you can watch the titanium. It's melted with lasers. It's it's so cool. It's absolutely rad. And if you can't get there, you can you know look on the website, and it's just mind blowing to be able to have that kind of manufacturing in the in this country in the UK, and that at the end of the the line, it's a bike that you can literally take out and ride, and it's made. It's so cool. And it's worked well for us, you know, where we're, we're riding so much and, and so many different projects on, to be able to be working with a team of people where, you know, we've got so much hands-on with the, the development, you know, we've been, we've been developing these bikes 
I think we were on, you know, around 21, 22 prototypes and, you know, the, the bikes are, are 3D printed, they're put together, they're built, then we can go out into the forest and test them, they're ridden locally, we can hammer them, and then the week after, we can have another prototype built to test again. So that whole process of, of, of you know, that whole R&D and the development side is, it, it just speeds the whole process up so much. It's almost a curse. I think the first year that we rode our own bikes, every race was a new prototype. You know, because you don't have to commit to a mold. You know, every single bike you build is is literally hat. You know, it's it's like custom built. Every bike you can change the geometry on everything. So they were literally changing, making changes every race. And it kept got to the point where we were like, you know, we're going to have to commit to something and actually put it out to market. <laughs> it's quite stressful. I don't think I did one run in 2019 on the same frame, like combination. But the guy, the first World Cup in Fort William, I was like, I definitely need a longer back end. And they literally printed it, they cured it in the oven, and then you drove it up on the Thursday, and I put it on on the Friday, and I was like, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> and then they put the other one back on, and it, I was like, sorry. Oh. Classic read. <laughs> Shall we take some questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah I think so. Running out of time, but just um, who's actually seen the Atherton bikes already so far today? Oh. Okay, so we've still got an opportunity for maybe another 50% of everyone to head over a little bit later on. But um, another opportunity to raise your hands. Who's got any questions that they would like to ask? We've got some roving microphones. We'll start in the middle here. Uh, wait, who broke the most bones? <laughs> oh, I don't know. No. That's pretty. Uh, that's a good question. I'd say we're pretty even. Yeah, she hadn't really broken any, and then he broke them all at once in one crack. <laughs> One big one. Dan's just had loads forever. Yeah, I kind of chilled out after breaking my neck. No, yeah, Dan, you broke your pelvis, your knee, your kneecap, your neck, like your arms and stuff, loads of stuff. A good stat is that I think between the three of us, we've broken everything. <laughs> we've worked, we've taken it in turns, broken a lot. <laughs> Choose a different sport. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Thoughts on um, Discovery taking over the television coverage next year and rearranging uh, EWS taking over the arrangements and stuff. Inside man, yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be good. I think it'll work. I think it'll work well. Yeah. You know, Red, Red Bull have Bounds, yeah, Red Bull have done a, such a good job over you know the last eleven years, and they've really helped the sport grow to where it is now. But I think there's you know there's definitely room for. A change now, and I think those guys are going to bring it to a new audience. And you know, from what I've heard and what I've spoken to so far with the guys, you know, organising it next year, it sounds. I think it will be good. It, you know, it's going to be a tricky transition, but you know, everyone's got used to seeing the World Cups presented so well from Red Bull. Like, you know, those guys have got their work cut out, but you know, at the same time, they're an enormous production company, and you know, I think it's going to be bloody good. Hi, Ayla. Um, when you're all sort of younger and didn't necessarily have your current skill set and abilities, what do you think um, helped push past the fear boundaries when you're trying to go sort of steeper, harder, faster, and build your skills? Do you think it was to do with like sibling peer pressure between yourself? It's actually what Dan would build, so like riding gnarly stuff and just not having a choice to go down it. Yeah, luckily, Athy was born with absolutely no sense. So as a child, he was just throwing himself off anything he could on a bike. So me and Rage inevitably followed him. Definitely peer pressure, though. If you're riding gnarly places, you have, eventually you will figure it out, I think. I think more so for Rage, because me and G were kind of pushing, and Rage just kind of got dragged along. And it, she, when she first started, she, was like, she didn't really enjoy riding, and then she started winning, and that was it. And coming to win. Hated riding, yeah. but like having someone like Dan and Jim always had each other. You know, you have a close friend or a sibling, or your dad or your mum, whatever, to to always ride with and, and kind of push you. That's that that goes really far, I think. Okay, we've got time for one more. Last question. Who uh, can jump the biggest? <laughs> Who can jump the biggest? Great question. <laughs> Gene can jump quite far, but he might not always land it. <laughs> wow. He can go really high, 
land on its head. Freeze one. <coughs> yeah. Dan. Quite probably, yeah. Actually. Probably not rage. Dan's good at jumps. Dan is fantastic at jumps, in fact. I think he actually did do a long jump contest once and managed to jump the furthest, but wasn't awarded the uh, trophy because he didn't land on his bike. <laughs> was that you for the bus? Another crash. No, it was... 661, was it? No, for dirt. Oh, right. In the field. <laughs> Big crash. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's been a brilliant chat with you guys. Thank you to the audience as well for all your questions. <laughs> it's been the applicants.